Hi, my name is Alex and welcome to part 2 of our Byzantium world conquest. I will start this video with admitting to a mistake. In my peace negotiations with Commonwealth at the end of part 1, I was carried away too much by taking the trade centers. What I realized after completing the video, I couldn't release Lithuania from the provinces I took. And Lithuania has the biggest amount of cores on the Commonwealth. To release it, I actually need provinces with Lithuanian culture, which are all up in the north. Here is the alternative peace deal with which I decided to go. From this, we can release Lithuania and set them as our first pranoyer. One of the viewers, Nima Jafarian, made a good point in his comment. I have been underusing the pranoyer system. Let's go ahead and use it. And now that we have landed the pranoyer in Lithuania, we can give them all those difficult to access provinces in the north. With this new peace configuration, we have reconquered Bulgaria. This opens a mission where we get Bulgarian as an accepted culture for free and gives a bunch of modifiers until the end of the game in Tirnovo province, along with some claims. Along with Lithuania, we now have claims on most of Commonwealth. Because we have taken the lands around Crimea in the Eastern European steppes, we got a new estate, the Kazakhs. Now, personally, I see every estate as an additional distraction from absolutism, but this estate does have some interesting privileges. Okay, I'm happier now, and I hope you see the reason behind this change. Look at all these provinces we can now reconquer for very little aggressive expansion and cheaper war score. With this settled, we can continue our expansion. Our next massive set of claims is down here in the south, in the lands of the Mamluks. We are now much stronger than them compared to our first war. To discourage them from attacking my troops, I am invading with two sets of two stacks that I am keeping close together. This way, even if they attack me, I can quickly reinforce and make sure that we win every battle. At this time, in 1540s, the Muslim troops may still be stronger than my Greek ones, so I want to take no chances. I don't have any particular science behind my troop movement. I just know that if I at least double my advantage, I will either scare my opponent away or win my battles. And like this, we literally win every engagement and occupy their forts. If you want to see how to truly optimize your battles, I suggest you watch Lambda XX. That man plays this game as a mathematical genius. Ok, we have our 100% war score and I'm taking a bunch of seaside provinces. I want to dominate the Mediterranean, obviously, and I want to push my way towards India. Remember how in part 1 I said that I expected Holland to be loyal to me? Well, it turns out they're anything but. As an experiment, I've set them up as a hereditary pranoyer, which apparently adds to their disloyalty. To solve this issue systemically, I just need more development and a stronger army. We are starting to look good on the map, given that we also have lands in Burgundy and Lithuania. I'm trying to keep my nation reasonably compact, so that as I expand, I keep dominating the trade. I have entered that stage of the game where I expand faster than my governing capacity allows, and after almost every war I am above my overextension limit. Ooh, Russia has formed. And they have immediately gone expansionist. They are my primary target to become my personal union. Let's see how much they expand before I am able to do so. I wanted to vassalize Crete, should have done it before accepting the Russian call to war. You may wonder why I am not creating more pranoyers or vassals in the lands I conquer. Two simple reasons really. One, it is still quite early in the game and I don't want to have a horde of disloyal subjects. At this stage of the game, I still prefer to use my diplomatic slots to have powerful allies. And two, I am expanding in the land which I consider strategic trade property. I much prefer to set up trade companies in the Near East and India, if I can. In the end of the day, it's just one of the possible many playstyles. Another very fair question which came up in the comments was why wouldn't I want to go for one faith as Byzantium? Both their idea set and missions are designed for that almost. Honestly, there is no particular reason. The person who asked it, 09119, is absolutely correct. If you want to go for a straightforward one faith world conquest, take Byzantium. In my case, I've done so many One Faith campaigns recently, I just wanted to have a chill recreational game. Who knew that the megalomaniacal world conquests would be my idea of fun? Well, ok, our financial balance is back in the green, we can keep going. I've sneakily invaded and occupied Cyprus. I hope Russia wouldn't mind if I take it for myself. A small coalition is starting to threaten me, but nothing to worry about. At least, not yet. If you are worried about coalitions, don't do what I just did. I have annexed a non cobelligerated country in a war where I was the secondary participant myself. That's basically the maximum aggressive expansion. The good news is we now can vassalize Crete. Surprisingly, they still had a high opinion of me. And this completes another one of our many missions. We have repulsed the republics by conquering all the Greek islands here. Our reward is plus 50 trade power in Constantinople until the end of the game. This sounds a lot to me. 
and some extra tax development in our Greek provinces. The Russian ruler died and their original dynasty was replaced with ours. That's the power of the royal marriages right there. They want my assistance in another war and they have been always at war just like me. I wonder if I should break my alliance now and claim their throne because they don't have an heir. I've decided to play along with them for a while to see what happens. Because I took active part in this war, the peace deal came fast. Russia annexed no guy. Apart from some prestige and favors, I got nothing out of it. Meanwhile, because I finished scoring my previous conquests and added them to trade companies, I'm starting to make some serious money. Russia, another war. Nah, I'm going to decline this one. And here is the reason. They got an heir with a weak claim. Because we share the same dynasty, I can claim their throne. The setup pretty much guarantees a personal union over them. They are now locked with their weak inheritance. By declining their call to war, I broke my alliance with them. I could have done it more elegantly by directly breaking their alliance. Instead of doing this dishonorable thing and losing diplomatic reputation and prestige. But I was too caught up in the moment and didn't notice the situation. Two other good things to note, we have no rebels for the first time since the start of this campaign and we are now the world's greatest power. We have overtaken France and Russia is number 3 with more than 1000 development. Russia has obviously grown very large. I will need a lot of war score to enforce my personal union on them. In preparation for that, I am trying to build a coalition. This will be an offensive war, so I will need at least 10 favors with each of my new allies for them to join my war effort. While waiting for our truce with Russia to expire, we can continue our expansion down south. My mid-game objective is to form the Roman Empire. That will be my only source of the extra admin efficiency. 5 from their government and 5 from their ideas. I am not in a hurry to do it, but it's just a nice objective. Byzantium is now a major regional power. We can easily bully our neighbors, with only a few exceptions. France being one of those. Tunis and their allies is now child's play. Marrakesh in Northwest Africa has a lot of forts. I don't want to spend too much time in this war, so I piece them out as soon as I can. Otherwise, it will take ages to occupy all their fortresses. As for Tunis, welcome to our empire, new citizens. It's now 1599 and the Catholic League has formed, only slightly behind schedule. An interesting strategy could be to meddle in this league war between the Protestants and Catholics and maneuver it towards the Peace of Westphalia outcome. This will permit any Christian to become the Holy Roman Emperor. Maybe one day I will try this strategy, but not today. My Pranoia Holland got integrated on their ruler death. In other words, the system is working. I immediately release them again, because I don't want to face the Dutch revolts, nor do I want to move my capital out of Constantinople. For now, I may keep them as a normal vassal, because the Dutch revolts last until 1650s, I will need to keep them around until that time. My ally Sweden had also allied Russia. It made sense, because we all had good relations with each other. I don't want to fight them in this war, so I carried enough favors with them to break the alliance with Russia. Ok, I'm now ready to go ahead and claim the Russian throne. This is probably the largest war of this campaign so far, at least geographically speaking. None of my allies will join me, but even without them I have almost 3 times the amount of troops than the enemy alliance. In a war like this, to claim the throne, I usually have two priorities. First, to get the capital as soon as possible, to get the ticking war score. And second, get the enemy allies out of the war. Georgia is ready to leave after just over a year. All it took was to besiege their capital. We can now concentrate our forces on the main objective. I have to say, fighting them alone is not easy. Their armies keep disappearing into the fog of war, only to reappear somewhere on the other side of the map. I am keeping a couple of stacks to occupy the forts and another couple to chase their armies. Luckily, for my sanity, most of their forts were still in the western part of their country. In some of my games, I saw the AI Russia conquer all the way into northern India and southern China and colonize the Spice Islands. This time, I've been able to intercept them before they go wild. Ok, the two greatest orthodox nations of this world, united by the ancient dynasty of Byzantium. Our total development right now is more than 3000. We are really on track for the world conquest. Russia will be disloyal for a while and they will really hate me. My priority is to bring their relations with me above zero before my ruler dies. Otherwise, of course, I will lose this personal union. Usually, this relationship improvement goes really fast with the PU. A lot of the negative relationship modifiers are temporary and they all decay pretty fast. Russia has done well in this short time. They have almost reached their modern borders. They are still colonizing the Far East and will reach Pacific very soon. We are now moving to the next level of strategy. Every colonizer will now be a strategic threat to me, simply because the empires take multiple wars to conquer, accompanied by plenty of global troop movement. 
I will need to start moving against them pretty soon. Some commenters have noticed that I haven't taken the exploration or expansion ideas. I may still take expansion very late in the game, if there is still uncolonized land left. For now, my focus is on the continental conquest. Colonization will simply distract me. As you see, I'm keen to continue conquering the Commonwealth. Unfortunately for me, they were smart enough to ally France. Attacking them now will really be a resource-intensive war. I am not ready for it yet. Instead, I have allied Scotland for now, so that I have a landing pad in the British Isles. You may know that you can use your allied territory for an attack. You will not get black flagged, even if they don't join your war. I have developed for the printing press in some of my provinces, and I even took the burger loans. I believe this is a valid strategic investment to keep our technologies modern. And for the next idea group I am taking administrative, that's a must for the world conquest. I keep hitting my governing capacity limit, and since recently I've started building state houses. Daily will pay 6.5 ducats per month for my printing press institution. I may be shooting myself in the foot by selling technology into India. But you know how fast it spreads in this game anyway. Austria has no heir, but I'm struggling to put my dynasty on their throne. The Habsburgs keep coming back. Potentially, I could disinherit my own heir to get the Habsburgs on my throne. Let's see, I quite like my old Byzantine dynasty. I noticed that Aragon was still not under the personal union with Castile, because they have gone Republican. And they were alone without any allies. Of course I have attacked them. Meanwhile, we have completed Promote the Emperor mission. It dramatically improves our trade in the Constantinople trade node. France has attacked Aragon before me, and I got worried that they will now start moving into the Iberia. I want to get as much Aragon as I can before France gobbles them up. At least the Mediterranean islands, including Malta and the northern African coast. There are so many priorities to attack now, it's very easy to lose focus. To stay organized, I'm trying to move along a couple of directions. First, keep taking provinces to form the Roman Empire. And second, keep moving east into the rich trade lands. France stands on the way of my first strategy. They are allied with Portugal with their large overseas empire, so I definitely need Spain to fight on my side. The problem is Castile has plus 200 relations with Portugal, and they are refusing to join my war. Using my favors, I've asked them to reduce their opinion of Portugal. But I still don't think it's enough to win against this global alliance. I would prefer to ally Portugal myself and have them break their alliance with France. Or maybe what I can do is pull Portugal into another war and make them break their French alliance this way. Ok, decided. I will not attack France just yet. Interestingly, after England stopped being Catholic, they also stopped hating me, probably because they lost all those Catholic negative relationship modifiers towards other Christians. Maybe I can ally them and bring them into my war with France. I have stopped actively going after the mission tree, so every time a mission becomes available, it's a nice surprise. This one, Book of the Prefect, gives us some temporary trade bonuses and to mercantilism. After I chickened out and backed off from attacking France, I moved my troops back to North Africa and smashed once again into the Mamluks. I know I can win this war at least. Another mission, another nice surprise. Princess of the Lasers, something to do with Trabizond, judging by the flag. Gives us cheaper advisors until the end of the game, power projection and some trade. Russia is now loyal and they are actively helping me fight this war. I have set my armies to auto siege, sat back, relaxed and waited for my war score to build up. Every full annexation here in the Near East is strategic for me. First, these countries will no longer interfere with my trade. And second, they will not join the coalitions. Shirvan was not a co-belligerent, and I cannot reach their lands to core, so I'm making my demands through Russia. This allows me to take only a few provinces from them. After my previous course completed, I took all this land from the Mamluks for 100% war score. I know this is not part of the Roman Empire, but it gives me access to the Horn on Africa and Aden, which is strategic trade land. Dominating this area will be fantastic to bring a lot of trade value from India later on. I am seriously overextended right now. The good news is my government allows me to create client states. And I decided to establish a client state called Jazeera down here in the south. As long as I establish them as a hereditary pronoia, I will integrate them for free. One thing to note here is it's critical to create pronoiers early on before they become too big. So release a vassal, make them a pronoia and then give them a lot of land. 98 overextension is something I can live with. For our next government reform, tier 7, the administrative clergy works well for me. I like the one extra free admin policy. Well, for now I have only one policy to take, but more coming soon. Actually, I'm doing quite well with the military point generation, so I don't mind taking one extra military policy, even if it's not free. 
a jam stands in the way of my eastward expansion. I have been greedily eyeing the rich lands of Persia for quite a while. I don't want to wait any longer. They are allied to half of the Muslim world, but with the loyal rush on my side, I have three or four times more troops. I know I've decided not to go for a one faith. But look at how strong my conversion power is. I am converting the wrong culture Muslim provinces, which are not in my states, in 7 to 8 months, without even stacking up all the available conversion modifiers. This is just an illustration how strong Byzantium is for a one faith playthrough. Shirvan has found itself on the wrong side of history once again. I am giving Russia one of their provinces simply to piece them out faster. I haven't made either the Mamluks or Timurids co-belligerents in this war, and I want short a truce timers with them, so I let Mamluks go just for their money. As for the Timurids, I want them to break their alliance with Yarkland, which is quite far away, and of course their money. The Timurids, by the way, are perilously close to forming Mughals. I wonder if they will manage to pull it off before I attack them. As for Ajam, it's 100% peace deal opening the expansion routes for me. They had a couple of allies in the south of the Arabian Peninsula, but I don't care about them for now. With this done, I come back to my little project of weakening France. France has two big allies, Portugal and the Commonwealth, and I notice that Commonwealth is allied to Georgia. If I attack Georgia, I will be able to break the alliance between the Commonwealth and France. As for Scotland, who is also my ally, I can use my favors to ask them to break their French alliance. I've been trying to ally Portugal since forever, but I haven't managed to do so because we're allied to mutual rivals. Ok then, we go after Georgia. They are a fellow Orthodox, and I cannot deus with them, but my mission tree has supplied me with claims on all of their provinces. Wait, usually the Commonwealth has a lot of forts, but it looks like they have destroyed all of them, and now they have a single level 1 fort in their capital, Warsaw. I wonder why they have become so poor. Maybe this is the effect of the embargo, which Russia and I have imposed on them, because most of their trade comes from the East. Between Hungary, Russia and myself, we overpower the Commonwealth. With no forts, they have nowhere to hide, and there is nothing to stop us from chasing their armies around the map. It's a pity I couldn't co belligerate them this time. Otherwise, I could thoroughly defeat them and take a lot of their provinces for Lithuania. As it stands, all I want is to break their French alliance. They can keep all of their other allies, including Venice, because those are very small countries. I can completely bankrupt them by forcing them to give me all their money, but that will make our truce longer, and I want to attack them soon. Alright, that was successful, and although I cannot fully annex Georgia yet, I can take all of their difficult forts in the mountains. And we immediately attack Aden, following our second priority of flowing a lot of rich trade into Constantinople. Just like Russia did before, Castile keeps calling me into the wars on the other side of the world. I routinely accept them for favor generation, although I never actually do anything. This war in the south included sieging some difficult forts. I fought a lot of nations, none of them co belligerated. Instead of making separate peace agreements with them and pumping up a lot of aggressive expansion, I prefer to lock them behind truce timers. I also timed finishing this war to the expiration of my truce with the Mamluks. Our troops are already in position for the attack. During this war, our Jazeera Pranoyer got integrated, automatically on the death of their ruler, and because I'm overflowing with the diplomatic mana, I started converting a bunch of provinces to Greek. The Mamluks seem to be developing their provinces all the time, and even a 100% peace deal doesn't look big on the map. I'm taking provinces in my best trade notes from them, creating a wide thoroughfare for the trade to flow from the east into my capital city. Although I am 140% overextended, I don't want to release new pranoyers. This side of the map is all about trade domination for me. Now, we have taken a bunch of land in the traditional Roman Empire territory, and we have opened a couple of missions for ourselves. Well, that's a nice mission. Prestige, missionary strength and more patriarch authority. The way I read it is it strengthens some previous missions. And this one gives more goods produced in Mesopotamia for 25 years and some admin power. While still fighting the Mamluks, I've brought my troops in position to attack the Commonwealth, but I've only now realized that most of the Lithuanian cores have expired. I have simply waited too long to attack the Commonwealth. Well, what can you do? My mistake. We have 5 or 6 times more troops than them, and they haven't built any new forts, so it's another war to search and destroy their armies. Pretty soon we can annex a bit more of Georgia, and we complete another mission, gaining plus 5 permanent power projection. The conditions for this mission are a bit strange. One option completes it by conquest, and the other option completes it by war. I wish I knew the practical difference. Anyway, we lost 10 years of separatism in the newly conquered lands, which is very nice. 
Meanwhile, we can get 100% Wosco from the Commonwealth. I'm chopping them up a little bit to make the life difficult for them and connect my lands. It's now 16.03, time for my traditional development progress check. Our usual milestone is 2000 development and we have more than 3000. I'm quite happy with our progress. Ok, despite what the flag says, we are not fighting the Catholic Crusaders. It's a random flag for one of the Native American federations. What I really want to fight are the Timurids, who have formed a nice regional power here in the east. After I broke their previous alliances, they managed to align Bengal, who are a sizable force of their own. However, it's a reasonably quick war, prolonged only by the travel distances, and about 4 years later we can take what we want. Among the things we want is this great monument in Nizva. After we upgrade it to the highest level, it will give us plus 10 maximum absolutism. That'll be a nice enabler for the successful court and country disaster. In preparation for the disaster, I've started withdrawing my estate privileges. Ah, Portugal. They're ready to royal marry us, but they're not ready to ally us. And England has broke off their alliance with us also. My anti-French coalition efforts are not doing so well. To make things worse, Portugal has the De Valois dynasty on their throne, and England has the Habsburgs. I can only hope that some overpowered personal unions don't form. I think I still got the old Portuguese dynasty and lost their own. I could be wrong though. But look, less than a year later, Portugal is ready to ally us. I hope now I can break them off from France. Let's start carrying favors with Portugal in a hurry. We'll need 50 favors to break that unholy alliance. A while ago, Austria placed their dynasty on my throne. And now they don't have an heir. It's a bit of a risky move, but I can claim their throne and break my alliance with them. And who knows, I may be able to PU England, who now shares their dynasty with me. Although in this campaign they're reasonably weak, and I don't mind conquering them outright. While meddling in the European politics, we can continue our expansion in the East. These are just a few small nations still in my trade. It's only natural that I want to integrate them. As I get more governing capacity, I start creating more full states. This is when I wish I had more territory in Europe, so I can keep these eastern lands in my trade companies. I don't mind making some separate peace agreements here, because I have some spare diplo power. Uh, what? Hold on, I heard something. The sound of HRE re-election, meaning the Austrian ruler has died. We lost our claim to the Austrian throne because Austria fell under our personal union. I haven't had this happen to me for a long time. A random, voluntary personal union like this. Now I like it because RNG is on my side, but I wonder if I should crash my game and restart. Well, this is random but repeatable. We've just taken one of the strongest powers in Europe. Well, it is part of the game, isn't it? I would not have restarted if I lost the claim, so I'll keep it. All we need to do now is improve our relations with Austria a little bit above zero, and that's our third personal union in this campaign secured. Apparently, we also share our dynasty with Hungary, I've just noticed. I've been a bit casual about my personal unions so far in this game. I may need to start paying more attention to my opportunities here. I've just watched a video by the student, where he describes the benefit of embracing free trade as T-rate government reform. Basically, it makes it easier to enact the policy to improve the inland routes by our traders, and that makes our sieges much faster. However, for this game, I've decided to go with my favorite, the war economy. In the background, for the last few years, I have been increasing the maximum absolutism. My target is to raise it to at least 85, so I can successfully pass the court and country disaster. After cancelling most of the estate privileges, we're almost there. I will be at 85 as soon as I launch my golden era. Well, actually, I'm already at 85. If I get more, it will go to the buffer. Now, I just need to mismanage my country for a few years to launch the disaster. I don't know, maybe I'm expanding too slowly, but I keep having excess admin power. I'm dumping it into full states for now. But honestly, I need to start conquering more land in Europe, which is more suitable to full state. This war is done, and I have more than enough admin power to core it all. As my first absolutism H ability, I'm taking the harsh treatment. This is a quick way to cheaply grow your absolutism. As my next idea group, I'm taking influence. I now have some large subjects to keep in check and later integrate. I also have a lot of extra diplo power, which I have been dumping into culture conversions. Well, here is a good opportunity to finally break the Franco-Portuguese alliance. As it happens in a lot of games, Portugal has allied Ethiopia. And if I attack Ethiopia, I can also fight Portugal without bringing France in to the fight. I'm trusting that Castile and its colonial nations will help me handle Portugal and their colonial nations. I also want Russia to send their troops over to Portugal, so I'm assigning both Castile and Russia to siege the Portuguese forts. It took a while to break the Portuguese will to fight, but I can now let them go in exchange for dropping some alliances. Most importantly, of course, with France. 
There you go, they are willing to ally me again once I am at peace. And we can now take whatever we want from Ethiopia. Ok, enough is enough. I've avoided my confrontation with France for several decades, and although I have grown stronger, so have they. Let's see how much damage we can deal here. Ooh, I forgot to break Scotland's alliance with France. Well, it's too late, let's just keep going. Unfortunately, most of the armies of my personal unions are down south, in the Near Eastern Africa, and a lot of my armies are over there also. To be fair, it's not the best way to prepare to fight a major opponent like this. We should be fine though, let's see. To help myself with a little stronger armies, I've decided to launch my Golden Era. Feels as good time as any, especially because I'm about to launch the Court and Country disaster. Because my stability is below 3, it's only plus 1, the Court and Country will kick off as soon as my Absolutism crosses 50. As long as my Revolt risk is above 1. I can help that by changing my icon. My current selection was the icon of Eleusa for cheaper harsh treatment. Unfortunately for this case it also gives minus 3 revolt risk. And if I enact the icon of St. Michael I will get the extra discipline and the unrest I need. For my next Splendor ability I'm taking the all important admin efficiency. And unfortunately I'm struggling to keep my unrest above 1. It will be easier as my war exhaustion grows. Here, we are back on with this disaster. In case you are wondering why I am spending so much effort to mess up my nation and trigger a disaster, well, the escorting country disaster gives us plus 20 maximum absolutism, which means we can max out our admin efficiency, plus 30 from absolutism, while still enacting some critical estate privileges. It's definitely not a must for the world conquest, especially now when there are so many ways to keep the maximum absolutism high, but I am a bit of a traditionalist in this way, and I tend to go for it almost always. Well, I have to say, our with France is going ahead swimmingly. We came well prepared for it, we are taking fort after fort and we are winning the major battles. Still, it took us 6 years to dominate their army and occupy their lands. They have a lot of high level forts, so taking each fort doesn't give us a lot of war score. But we are now ready to sign our peace agreement. We are now in the middle of our court and country disaster, so we are of course getting a lot of revolts. We have already pieced out all the France's small allies. And from France I'm trying to take as many forts as I can in one peace deal. Visually it's not making a dent, because the provinces I'm taking are high development. But this will make France weaker and our next war with them easier. Well, I feel good. One of the most difficult wars of this campaign was a success. It was reasonably messy, because France did send a bunch of soldiers all the way down to Africa and I had to chase them around the continent. And our allies got exhausted and started dropping out of the war one after another. Another, but we managed. My next target is Rome. It's needed for my missions. Owning Rome gives me one extra missionary and fulfilling the Pentarchy will give me another missionary. Also, during the war with France quite a lot of nations joined a coalition against me and for some reason Rome hasn't. Thus they became my target. The war allied to Hungary and this time I remembered to ask Hungary to break their alliance before declaring on Rome. Yeah, the coalition is still growing. I don't believe they will declare on me but they will definitely slow me down. Castile has been my loyal supporter, so I just as loyally join all their wars, even though I continue doing nothing to actually help them. After completing their influence ideas, I can finally use the free admin policy. This one is for cheaper diplomatic annexation. Alright, we can now take what we want. It's only a few provinces, but the coalition is massive. A lot of these countries became unhappy with me after I attacked France. But it had to be done, and I'm betting that my size, vassals and personal unions and allies will deter the coalition from attacking. It has been a while since we received a proper Byzantium event, because we have long stepped out from the Byzantium core mission tree. But we got Rome reclaimed. A little bit of mana never hurts. Strangely, while everyone hates me, England likes me enough to ally me. I guess they appreciated my efforts beating up France. I was wondering why my court and country disaster was still going. Apparently my war exhaustion was too high. So we lower it and we successfully complete the disaster. We now have 120 maximum absolutism. That is a very comfortable amount for me. We can now reenact the icon of Eleusa and harsh treat our rebels to increase our absolutism. At 100 absolutism we get 30 admin efficiency. Completing this disaster also removed the economic debuffs we were living with for the last 10 years. Our income is back to a good level. Look, I found another country not in a coalition against me. The little Mzap over here allied to Tunis. Quick and easy war just to keep things moving along. 
All I did for six years after that was internal perfection, building buildings, improving relations, and so on. And the very moment our truce with France expired, we attacked them again, not giving them a single chance to join the coalition. The reason Portugal didn't join France against me, and the reason why the troops are blue right now, is because I'm helping them in another war. I didn't plan it this way, but it worked out well. The second war should be much easier. We literally have five times more troops than they do. Although some of our allied armies are over in the Spanish Americas. This war actually took longer than 10 years. The French fought very well this time, but we have broken their resistance. And in this peace agreement, I am again taking as many forts as I can. I am also finally connecting my heartland to the lands I got from Burgundy with a direct path. Well, yeah, France will still take a lot of effort. Alright, I think it's another logical break in our story. In this second episode, we have grown a lot. Not only we have conquered quite a lot of land to own directly, we enforced our personal unions on Russia and Austria, we have seriously weakened Commonwealth in France in a series of wars, and we have successfully completed the court and country disaster. This completes creating a power base. And the next episode will be all about the global expansion blobbing Armageddon. As always, if you do want to see the next episode, please give this one a like. It's the best form of supporting the channel and letting me know that you want me to continue. For now, thank you for watching and see you in the next video.